This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, good morning, good evening, no matter what time of day it is, we are just honored and humbled you tuned in for another edition of the Farm Monitor. As the announcer said, I am Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. Not to sound like a broken record, but as always, we've got a heck of a show for you. Now, coming up, their grapes high quality, their reputation impeccable. So what separates this Georgia winery apart from many others, including those on the East Coast? We'll explain. Also on the show, perseverance at its finest. This farm market owner opens up to us about her family's history in agriculture and what someone said to her that set in motion the drive to become a successful business owner. And for you dairy producers, a must-see story about a new program that could lead to more money in your wallet. All this and more starts right now on the Farm Monitor. We begin in Georgia wine country, in particular Yona Mountain Vineyards, which reportedly has one of the largest solar programs in the region. A growing trend in the wine industry, more so out in California, which accounts for about 90% of the wine produced here in the U.S. But as Damon Jones reports, you don't have to travel thousands of miles just to find a good high-quality vintage or voltage. From the outside, this might just look like another beautiful vineyard tucked away in the foothills of Yona Mountain. But take a closer look and you'll find it's one of the most energy-efficient, environmentally-friendly operations in the entire state. In fact, they recently became the only winery on the East Coast to use solar panels as their main source of energy. Well, we've actually been talking about solar since the beginning. We love to be on the cusp of the cutting edge. Uh, my father and I love technology and electronics, and we always loved this whole idea, and we, we married together with sustainability. We got the right solar company, and we got together with them, and they price it out for us. And so we said, let's get as big as we possibly can and which is around 60 to 70 percent of our annual usage. And so we uh, pulled the trigger last year. Uh, we started the project in August and we finally came online late February of this year. While the installation was both expensive and time consuming, in the long run it will not only help the environment but their pocketbook as well. So our March power bill was the first full month that we got. So last year's March bill was about $2,500 and this year's March bill was $800. Between the solar panels, LED lighting, charging stations, and even a bee colony, Yona Mountain Vineyards is helping lead the way in sustainability. I always felt it was a huge necessity. Like if we can help the environment and do more things for the planet and be more uh, environmentally friendly and you know sus more sustainable in every single way we can, I think you know it's kind of our duty to do that. That's not the only thing this operation is known for, though, as they also produce some of the highest quality wine on the market. I said if I'm going to do this and make wine, I want to make really good wine. I don't want to just make wine. The way I determined that was blind taste tests. And I would take our wine against some fine wines out of California, $100 bottles, $200 bottles, gather people together. Uh, we'd have 15 people tasting, and 10 out of the 15 thought our wine would be better than the expensive wines from California. That's when we knew we had a pretty good product. 65 to 80 percent of the time, we will beat those wines. So we know that it's possible to grow good grapes right here in Georgia. And one of these decades, we're going to be on the map, just like Napa Valley or Burgundy or Bordeaux. And that type of quality doesn't come easy as they use some of the best products on the market while also paying attention to the small details. To do what we do, our yeast product is much more expensive. We use French oak barrels, which are $1,200 instead of $300 American oak barrels. Uh, the energy effort we put into is a lot more than what a very simple large winery would be doing. While places like Napa Valley and Sonoma are considered the pinnacle of wine production in the U.S., Miller believes that Georgia could soon earn that kind of reputation. So I love the wine snobs to come and visit us because there's not a good reputation for wine necessarily in Georgia. Um, a lot of people think it's not a very good product, so I just said, come and see us, taste our wine, see what you think, and we turn people around. Reporting from Cleveland, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Meantime, broadband is no longer a luxury, it is a necessity. That, my friends, a direct quote from American Farm Bureau President Zippy Duvall in response to a new bill that would enhance the accuracy of broadband coverage maps. 
an issue right now that is delaying many rural areas from receiving high-speed Internet access. R.J. Carney, Senior Director of Congressional Relations for American Farm Bureau, says the legislation would improve the accuracy of broadband mapping through public feedback, third-party commercial data, and on-ground field validation. The current mapping system uses what are called census blocks, which, according to Carney, fail to paint an accurate picture of broadband coverage areas. The reason census blocks is so detrimental to rural areas is if one entity, a household, a hospital, a school, a library, receives broadband, then that entire census block is considered fully covered, even if it's only one entity in that entire census block that is covered. For precision agricultural purposes, farmers and ranchers want to be more efficient, economical, and responsive to environmental needs. In order to do so, they need connectivity in their farmlands and out in the ranch lands as well. For rural communities, they need access to modern technologies for education purposes, distance learning, for healthcare purposes with telemedicine, also for public safety and entrepreneurship. Well, getting people excited about leaving the house nowadays can be tricky with so many distractions like video games, mm -hmm. TV and cell phones, but a new program in Georgia is hoping to fix that problem. It's called the Georgia Farm Bureau Farm Passport Program. John Holcomb explains. If you take a drive throughout Georgia, chances are you'll come across a certified farm market. There are dozens of them in the state, and depending on where you're at or what season it is, you can find all kinds of locally grown food or things to do with the family. To make it more appealing and to get people more excited about farm markets, the Farm Passport Program was created. I'm inspired by the farmers and the work that they put into making a safe and healthy food supply for us. Especially in Georgia, there's all kinds of farmers, and I want people to be able to see uh, the work that goes into agriculture and the diversity of it. Farmers and ranchers are also excited about the program as they think it will help bring people out to their farms and to help educate people about Georgia's number one industry. It's just more traffic, um, more more promoting, um, and and I think a lot of people that I've talked to is excited about traveling around and, and, and hitting all the um, certified farm markets and, 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 and completing this passport and it's just going to give us another another venue of, of getting people to the farm um, and educating us educating the public about all the farm markets in the area. But the reason for the program is more than just farm promotion. According to Thompson, she wanted the program to be educational and also be a great family experience. I'm really hoping for people to get excited with me about learning about agriculture and I want people to have the fun experiences with their family of picking strawberries that it's right right now uh, but all going all through the seasons throughout the year of um, seeing where vegetables are grown and what things look like what certain foods look like before they're even picked because they don't look the same in the grocery store. One great thing is that the program is statewide and year-long which allows people to get a full year of Georgia agriculture in which includes a chance to pick everything from strawberries to peaches to apples and so much more. There are 67 farms in the Passport Program this year and they are all across the state. And so there are folks that are literally open two months out of the year to do strawberries. And then we have year-long operations where they have, they start off with an early fruit or vegetable and they continue through the summer and into the winter, always having something that they're growing. But the chance to go out and pick fruits and vegetables isn't all. Many of the farms have all kinds of other activities to do for the whole family. These farms are more than just food. They also, because they want you to come and visit them, they have made fun things for you to do while you come. And so that can look like picking your own vegetables or that could look like going on a farm tour or a field trip or doing fun festivals throughout the year. That's not all though. One of the other neat things about the program is that as you go visit farms, you get rewarded for it. As you're going through and you're getting your passport stamped, you'll physically go to a farm and they have stamps for you to show that you've been there. And then once you do that, at the end of the year in January, you will mail your passport back to me and I will return your passport along with your prizes back to you. Reporting in Colbert for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. John, thanks so much. Well, you know what they say, one person's trash is another person's treasure. In this case, an old mule barn once scheduled for demolition is now a treasure for the entire community of Griffin, Georgia.
Hey, I'm Kanisha Miller. I'm the owner of EM Farms here in Salem, Georgia. EM Farms is an on-farm market. We provide fresh fruit and vegetables. We have collards available. We have tomatoes. You can pick them yourself. You can pick your collards yourself. You can come and get some herbs for seasoning. You can come and get strawberries, scumnums, and also we make preserve out of our fruits. So you can get some scumnum jelly, some strawberry preserve. I started EM Farms for a totally different reason than the reason that I continue to farm today. Last year, I find myself in a predicament where someone had the power to tell me no on a financial situation, and I didn't like the way I, it felt at all. So I decided to do something about it. I needed to start a business. But in what? I just thought about, what have I been around all my life? Well, I've been around agriculture all my life, both of my grandparents' farm. I went to school and graduated from Fort Bell State University in agriculture economics. I've been working over five years in an agriculture-related career field so it only makes sense to start farming. The reason I continue today is because of the amazing feedback I got from my community. Last year, I didn't have anything you see out here today. All I had was those nine raised boxes and a shade tree, and they still made sure they came out to support me. People in the community would stop by my stand first before they go to the local um, grocery store to make sure they could support me before they went to the commercial spot. I mean, that means a lot. People stop by, give me seeds, transplants to plant, and ask for nothing in return. They'll come by, all my equipment, help me chop in the field. I mean, it means so much to me, so I can't stop for my community. This property is my grandfather's property. And I want to, my dad had this land, and I asked him, could I do something with it? So I started farming it. My grandfather farmed this land 40 years ago. My dad always tell me stories when he's out here. He said he saw watermen on this same piece of land 40 years ago. And that, it really means something to me. And the fact that I actually grew up in a house, two, two houses down, and my parents got married in that house. But they got married in the front yard of that house. It, it means a lot. Well, thanks to a $1 million gift from the Dundee Community Association, a once aging rundown mule barn on the campus of UGA Griffin is now a social hotspot and a dream come true for Marcy Bradbury, owner and operator of From the Farm at the Dundee Cafe. A small piece of history, now a little piece of heaven for all who enter. The building is the oldest on campus. It was um, built in the early part of the last century. The building next to it, which was also a mule barn house, was struck by lightning and burned down. So they rebuilt this one, eliminated the one that was burned down, of course, and just put this one on that site in 1912. It was made of a special construction called um, slip concrete, which in its day was a brand new way of making buildings. And it's still that today. It still has the original concrete in it. I am blessed, blessed. I'm blessed to be the vendor in this facility. Um, it has been an opportunity that I never thought that I would have. And so when I was approached about this opportunity last year, um, it kind of fit into the niche of what I do. And um, UGA has been very welcoming um, and they've done er anything and everything that I've ever asked for. And so I'm very, very blessed to be here. I have two favorite parts. One are the turkey tracks in the conference room. It's really cool because the epoxy they put on the floor doesn't compromise what the concrete floor is. And so all the imperfections that you see in the floor, you can actually see them, but we can mop them at the same time. So it's, it's nice about that. But there's turkey tracks, there's raccoon tracks. Um, those are really cool. And then being able to look at the walls and see what the people who worked here wrote on the walls because they would write on it you know, as the mules were bringing in whatever they were, you know, whatever they brought in. And so they wrote all these calculations on the wall. And it, it, to be able to see that part of history, I mean, I can see the walls, I can see what they made, but actually see how somebody worked and what they did to me is just fascinating. 
This did house mules until the mid part of last century and then of course tractors came into play and then it housed tractors and eventually um, it was just a storage unit. And then it was on a demolition list to be demolished um, and some people on the campus including the former assistant dean here, Dr. Arkin, saw um, a potential of it being something special on campus and thus it was kind of the birth and the vision of the Mule Barn Cafe. What we do is we do as much as we can farm to table. Our specials every day are done farm to table. Right now, the only thing that's really available are greens, uh, kale, cauliflower just came up, so we had cauliflower soup this week. Um, you know, so as things come into the farm and to, the, to my local farmers that I use, then I'm able to use those here at the cafe. So we do as much as we can. So what we have, we have a, an item here called mule feed, and it just happened to come around and someone called it mule feed and it's a kale salad and one of my local farmers grows the kale just for me and so we can have that it's a it's a softer kale we like the, the flavor and the texture of it and so we use as much as we can i'm also um, working with food suppliers and finding out where my food is coming from and if i can get it out of georgia and i can get it locally that's what i'm going for we have people now uh, filling up our parking lot right next to the cafe coming in taking advantage of it taking advantage of the bre wonderful breakfast and lunches that are open to the community. A lot of people are maybe under the perception that it is just for the campus, but it's not. It's a, it's a City of Griffin uh, restaurant. People from all over the area can come in anytime and enjoy it. Really neat concept, isn't it? Well, stay with us. Up next, a first of its kind program for dairy farmers touting unique opportunities to build new profit centers. The U.S. dairy industry is at a time of transition. Facing a nearly five-year cycle of downward markets, farmers are looking to new business opportunities in order to remain sustainable. One trend is a growing number of dairy farmers who are breeding portions of their herd to beef cattle. Holstein Association USA's CEO, John Meyer. At the Holstein Association, one of the things that we strive to do is to provide our members with opportunity to be more profitable. And uh, through breeding some of their herd to beef bulls, the right beef bulls, uh, we could potentially ha have them have a new profit center on their dairy farm. And now, for the first time, Holstein producers have a resource when determining what beef bulls might work best on their dairy cows. It's called Wholesome, a collaborative effort between Holstein Association USA and the American Simmental Association, Holstein identifies elite Sim Angus bulls with production attributes specifically matched to Holstein cows. American Simmental Association Director of Commercial and Industry Operations, Chip Kemp, explains. We're all aware of some of the serious economic pressures that the dairy producers face at this point in time. Um, some of those clearly are on the more traditional side of their business. But also on the terminal calf side, they've faced unparalleled pressures. And so all we're trying to do is take the same approach that dairy producers and Holstein members specifically are used to, and that's taking the best tools available at that point in time and apply them to a profit portion of their business. The Wholesome program, launched this spring, provides a list of wholesome bulls that Holstein producers can easily identify from their semen provider. It's a first ever partnership across the dairy and beef breeds, Meyer says. What's really unique about this program is that this is the first time that there has ever been an index that has been established to be complementary to both a beef breed and a dairy breed. Through the International Genetic Solutions Platform, we took an effort to take a breed agnostic look across all breed types of what type of beef bulls make the most sense to complement a Holstein female to add the most profitability to that terminal calf. The Wholesome Index and resulting sires list was generated using powerful data provided by International Genetic Solutions and its Feeder Profit Calculator, the industry leader in feeder cattle evaluation. Qualifying for the sire list is not easy, and bulls that do so represent an elite group of beef genetics. Instead of just saying, I'm going to breed my Holstein to a black beef bull, they can say, I'm going to breed my Holstein 
to a Sim Angus bull that is in the Wholesome program that ranks high on the Wholesome index. And by doing that, I know that we, we're going to get offspring that will be coveted both um, by the feedlot and the consumer. We think with time, as we gain the confidence of the buyers, we'll put more money back in the pocket of commercial dairymen. To view a list of wholesome eligible bulls, visit HolsteinUSA.com or Simmental.org. For Holstein Association USA, I'm Miles Ramsey. Well, finally this week, did you know that nationally the nursery industry contributes $4 billion annually to our economy? And because of that, researchers in Tennessee are currently developing sprayer technology that improves how nurseries apply pesticides. Charles Denny has more on reducing chemicals and perhaps increasing profits. There's new helpful technology for the nursery industry, applying pesticides in just the right amount in just the right location. It's called an intelligent sprayer, and here it is in action. The mist is the pesticide application, carefully distributed in this orchard. For the Hale and Hines Nursery in McMinnville, where they grow 400 varieties of trees, James Hines says it improves the quality of their plants and reduces expenses. Previously, we'd have to drive down our roadways and just blast the chemical in the general direction of the plant. Now, with the intelligent sprayer technology, we're able to target the plant directly and have hardly any off-target loss. And what's that mean for you, bottom dollar-wise, that has to help? It, sure, it saves dollars and it saves the bees that, that we're not hitting inadvertently. The sprayer uses lasers, sensors, and variable rate nozzles. Combined, they allow the machine to see a plant, its shape and size, and then apply just the right amount of pesticide. Hale and Hines reduce pesticide usage 40%, and that's happening at other nurseries. As orchards grow and trees become thicker, the sprayer technology can save operators more than $200 per acre in pesticide cost. Uh, there's been a reduction in actual pesticide usage, and depending on the stage of tree development, it'll run anywhere from uh, 35 to up to 70 percent or more. Plant scientists with UT's Institute of Agriculture worked with the USDA Application Technology Research Unit, other universities, and a company called Smart Guided Systems to commercialize the sprayer. And nursery owners have been able to adapt existing equipment here. And now we're in phase two. We're looking at um, a very practical approach so that growers can have access to the technology without buying a brand new sprayer. We retrofit existing sprayers with the sensing system. Amy Fulcher with UT Extension says not only does the correct amount go on the plant, but there's very little wasted pesticide, which is good for the ecosystem. Whenever the pesticide goes in the air, behind the target crop, on the ground, that's not helping anyone. So we've been able to help um, make sure that the pesticide goes right on the target crop. It took a decade of research to come up with the intelligent sprayer, and spring 2019 is the first time we've seen widespread use. UTIA will continue to work with nurseries here. Precision equates to efficiency. This is Charles Denny reporting. Charles, thank you very much, and folks, thank you for watching our show. Here's a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm. Be sure you check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and with us here on the show. Take care, everybody. We will see you next week right here on the Farm Monitor. Have a great week.